Hi, my name is Mary Pat O'Malley and I am a speech and language therapist and a lecturer in speech and language therapy in NUI Galway. And I'm going to be telling you today all about what speech and language therapy is. So basically it is a profession where we provide treatment, support and care for children and adults who have difficulties in any aspect of speech, language, communication, and eating, drinking, and swallowing. It's very broad ranging because we can work with, for example, premature babies who have trouble feeding through to toddlers who haven't started using words yet, to adults who stutter or who've had a stroke, for example, and their language has been affected. And we are considered allied health professionals. So our, the first, obviously, most important people that we work with are the clients and families who are experiencing the speech, language, communication, um, or feeding and swallowing issues. And then we will also work together with other professionals, such as teachers, nurses, occupational therapists, psychologists, maybe audiologists as well, uh, ENT surgeons, for example, could be plastic surgeons, um, if the child has a cleft lip or palate. And we have many different names. So in Ireland, we are called speech and language therapists and the same in the UK, but in America and Canada, we're known as speech language pathologists. And in Australia, we're speech pathologists and New Zealand speech language therapists. And then we, in, obviously in different countries and different languages, we are, have another range of, of names. But um, for Ireland, speech and language therapists is what we tend to be called. And what do we do? So the IASLT is the Irish Association for Speech and Language Therapists, and they have recently revamped their websites. And there's a lot of information there um, about the different things that we do. So it's well worth a look at that. So our role basically is to assess, diagnose, and then support people who have communication needs to fulfill their social, educational, emotional, and vocational potential, and ensure safe swallowing for those who have feeding, eating, drinking, and swallowing needs. What does this mean? So basically it means that if you have a concern about, let's say your child is slow to talk, and they speak two or more languages, you would talk to the speech and language therapist about your concerns. And we can assess children from very early on, from as early as eight months really. And we can look at how are they communicating, um, what, are they understanding in terms of language and work out then what is the nature of the issue? So that's the diagnosis part. And then we would work with the family to support you to, let's say in that case of the child who's slow to talk or late to talk, um, how to develop their language and encourage um, first words to emerge, we'll say, for example, because it's really important to remember that speech and language are really the purpose of them is to establish relationships with other people um, to participate in life. And that means being able to participate in your education, being able to communicate about what is going on internally for you. What are you feeling? What do you want? Uh, and also to be able to access um, the workplace, for example, be able to, let's say, ask for a rise or a raise, excuse me, um, be able to present yourself well at interview and communicate why you would be a good fit for the job, for example. And then a part maybe of the role of the SLT that um, people aren't maybe that aware of would be to do with the feeding, eating, drinking and swallowing. And in Ireland, we are the professionals who are responsible for ensuring safe swallowing. Where people may have had a stroke, for example, or like I said, for babies who were born prematurely and have difficulty feeding. So how do we talk and swallow? And basically we tend to take talking and swallowing for granted when we don't have any problems. And it's only when you know challenges emerge that maybe we become aware of them. So this is a diagram of the side. If you imagine the head divided this way and it's a, a look in from the side. And what we are looking at is the nasal cavity. So that's, if you think of up your nostrils, there is a nasal cavity, and then we have the lips and we have the tongue, for example, and the roof of your mouth. And these are all, these are called articulators. And these are the, the parts of the mouth that we use to create speech. So I'm just going to give you an example or to invite you to um, make the word, the sound and feel where is your tongue when you're producing the So for me, the, front of or the tip of my tongue is behind my lower teeth and for other people it would be behind their top teeth or their upper teeth 
there's no right or wrong here. The key thing is if the sounds acceptable. So there's variation in terms of where we make the different sounds. Now I'd invite you to do this again and put your fingers on your nose. And this time I want you to do an mm, and put your fingers on your nose, on the bone of your nose. Mm, mm. And you should be able to feel the, bo the bones in your nose vibrating when you're producing the mm. And that's because mm is called a nasal sound. And what's happening is your palate, if you look in your, in your mouth in the mirror and you'll see at the back of your mouth, the palate and the little dangly, uh, that's called your uvula hanging down. Um, and when you're making an mm, here, this would be down and the yellow would go up here. So it shows, it's showing you that air is going into the nose and causing the bones in your nose to vibrate. And that's why when you go mm, you're feeling the bones vibrate there. Whereas with when you're saying this is what's happening. The soft palate at the back is closing against what's called the pharyngeal wall here. So no air is allowed to escape into the nasal cavity. So the bones won't vibrate because it's like, it's like an echo if you think of like a of where a sound is vibrating. Um, so that's in terms of how we talk. Swallowing is similar in terms of when you swallow, you don't want food going into the nasal cavity. Um, you want it going down. Um, not into through the larynx or into the airway, but down into the esophagus and on into the stomach. And for children, let's say who have uh, a cleft, who were born with a cleft palate and have the palate repaired, they can have difficulty here where air is escaping into the nose for speech when it shouldn't. So you get the idea, it's quite complex and there's lots of opportunity for things to kind of go awry. And that's just to give you an example of um, how we talk and swallow. Now we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, the kinds of difficulties people can experience. And again, because we're talking across the lifespan, there are lots of different um, communication and swallowing um, disorders. So fluency is the name for, we'll say when somebody stutters or stammers. Um, and we would work with people across the lifespan, again, from childhood all the way through to adulthood who have difficulties with fluency. If we talk about speech, then we're talking about pronunciation. So for example, having a lisp, if you're, um, so where your tongue comes between your teeth. So when you say your, your tongue is meant to be behind your teeth, and then for English speakers, if you have a lisp, it would be like, so it's the tongue is protruding. Uh, other examples to do with speech would be where a child, for example, might be saying tar when they mean car, date when they mean gate, beyond the age at which that would be considered part of typical development. Uh, when it comes to language difficulties, I've already mentioned things like, you know, a child whose first words are late to emerge, um, or if let's say they do have some uh, single words, but they're not yet combining words, or they seem to be having difficulty understanding what's being said to them, following instructions, um, difficulties with maybe the early stages of learning to read, like we would work with all of those kinds of scenarios. Voice then, like I said, is if you have like teachers, maybe or sports coaches, um, and it can happen with children as well, where they have what's called a voice disorder. And there are lots of different kind of um, types of problems there. But a, a common symptom would be, let's say, for example, being hoarse. If we think of communication, then that kind of is moving into the realm of things like social communication. So, for example, um, knowing how to uh, ask for something in a way, let's say if it's communicating with your boss at work versus communicating with your peers and how to use language to communicate appropriately is kind of a favorite word of speech and language therapists, but it's like to match your communication to the setting that you're in would be the kind of the key thing. Um, and then obviously we have the issues with uh, swallowing, which can uh, result, let's say, as a, for babies who are born with cleft lip and palate, for example, maybe have trouble feeding initially, um, or somebody who's had a stroke or somebody who has maybe um, a progressive condition like uh, multiple sclerosis or motor neuron disease and struggles to swallow. Um, my own bias here towards children is coming in because I should have said in relation to language, we would also work with adults, for example, who have had a stroke and have experienced um, changes to do with language in terms of being able to express themselves or understand, um, for example, after the stroke. And when it comes to language, we need to think about 
um, is it spoken language or written language? Because we would work with both spoken and written language. And also then we think about, is it understanding of language or is it use of language? So other kind of specific examples um, or ways we talk about, you know, communication and swallowing disorders would be neurological conditions, which means basically to do with in the brain. So a stroke, for example, motor neuron disease, multiple sclerosis, traumatic brain injury. So if somebody was involved in an accident, let's say a car accident or had a fall where they hit their head, they may have speech language and communication issues as a result. So we would work with people, um, children who are, have cerebral palsy, for example, would also see the speech and language therapist for speech language communication and swallowing as they which as they needed it um, people who have hearing impairment so speech and language therapists would work with children um, and adults who have received cochlear implants for example uh, we work with people who have intellectual disability um, there is uh, it was if you think of child and adolescent mental mental health services so cams we would work on those teams too where you'd have, let's say, for example, um, children who may have selective mutism, so they are silent in certain situations. Uh, we would work with uh, people who have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. Um, there are speech and language therapists who work with people who have schizophrenia. Um, and then, for example, head and neck cancer. So uh, cancer of the larynx, we we'll say, or the tongue, for example, we would also work with, with people to help them um, improve communication after they've had treatment. How do you get to see us then? Um, so in Ireland, basically, you, if you were um, admitted to in a hospital yourself, or if your child was admitted to hospital and needed SLT, then the SLT would automatically be involved in your care as part of the rehab team or the hospital team. And then if you or your child were on the point where you were leaving hospital, you would be referred to your local community services. Um, so your local community services, you think of your um, lo your local, the public health nurse or the primary care office, for example, is where is like your local health center, your health clinic. Um, and you can refer yourself, basically, if you are the parent of a child who's just born or up to 17 years and 11 months, because at 18 years, the service would be considered the adult service. Um, but for that age range, you can actually refer yourself by contacting the local health office um, and completing a referral form. And you would find the details of the local health offices on the HSE website. If your child is under five then and they have difficulties in more than just speech and language, so let's say they may be slow to walk as well as talk or slow to toilet train, for example, um, they may need to be referred to what's called the early intervention team and the speech and language therapist would see them as part of that process. Um, and there's a detailed referral form there, so that's a different route, so maybe via your GP. And we'll say when it comes to children as well, you know, the public health nurses are involved in doing developmental checks. So you could discuss your concerns there um, if you were worried, for example, that your child was not talking when you expected them to. Um, and then if your child is attending a HSE funded voluntary service like, for example, Enable Ireland or the Brothers of Charity, um, providing specific services for people with physical or intellectual disabilities, then if they need speech and language therapy as part of that service, it will be provided um, in that service. So that's for adults, or for children rather. And then for adults, basically, um, the, like I mentioned, there is like the hospital service if you were in hospital. And then there are like community services in the primary health care centres. And then in the child and adolescent mental health services, there are also specific adult and child services available through there. So where do we work? Like, where can you find us? Um, lots of places, it turns out. So in the HSE primary care and health centres, those early intervention teams I mentioned, and school age disability teams in hospitals for acute care, private hospitals, outpatient departments, rehabilitation centres, the CAMS teams, so child and adolescent mental health services, adult mental health services, intellectual disability services. We also work in language classes in mainstream schools. So a language class is a class where there's a particular process of referral where children who have, um, let's say, they have to meet particular criteria for speech and language issues. And they would go to the language class maybe for a year or two years where they get intensive speech and language therapy. Um, and the speech and language therapist works very closely with the teacher. Um, and then they would return to mainstream school, so their language classes. Then we also work in mainstream schools, special educational settings, 
charities of voluntary organisations for people with disabilities. Um, speech and language therapists also work in courtrooms, prisons and young offenders institutions um, because often um, people who are in this position may have a, a language difficulty, which means they have would have difficulty understanding, let's say, the complex language of what's going on in the courtroom. Um, so speech and language therapists would do work on just, or how would I say, like, make creating awareness of speech and language difficulties in let's say groups such as young offenders. Uh, we work in day centres, we uh, maybe do home visits. So obviously things have changed now with COVID. So um, a lot of teletherapy would be happening. So that would be via Zoom or the HSC um, uh, system. And that's where we would be able to see people directly in their home. And that can be very effective, you know, particularly for people who live far from the clinic um, and need to travel if you can do the therapy online, if it's a good fit for what the person needs and that can cut out, you know, unnecessary travel. We also work independently or in private practice. If you're looking for an independent therapist in independent or private practice, um, there is a website specifically for that where you can search by county um, and by the type of problem uh, to find a group or to find suggestions. And then we might also work in community development settings. So I've just put up a list of some resources there um, that you might look at. So Talk Nua is, I'm flying my own flag here, and that is basically a, a, web, a blog that I have created for parents, particularly of children who speak two or more languages, because there's a lot of misinformation out there about um, speech and language development in these children. And um, just to reassure you that if you are the parent of a child who speaks two or more languages, it doesn't cause speech and language difficulties and it doesn't make them worse. And you should never follow advice to drop your home language um, because that isn't following best practice. So on the Talk Nua blog, I have a range of articles covering, let's say, children who are slow to talk and speak two or more languages, um, how to read together with your child to uh, enhance language development, for example, how to support home language development, um, and it's all based on the research, but I've written it kind of in a way that's accessible. And then Peach is uh, an EU wide project that I've been involved in. And it's really fantastic because it has a range of, there are two guides in particular that are really worth looking at. And one is for parents who are raising multilingual children. And the guide is available in English and a range of other languages. And then there's a guide for educators as well. So for people who have multilingual children in their preschool or in the classroom, it's evidence based, available in a range of languages, and also has. Um, there's a database of resources in the 24 um, languages of the EU. Um, so you can find activities for children of different ages and different kinds of activities to foster like your home language. And you can also put in um, your own resources that, you're, uh, that you know about into the database as well. So um, if you just Google Peach Erasmus, um, that should come up. So uh, then in terms of the professional bodies, and they have, again, lots of very good information about in more detail about the different speech, language and communication issues I've mentioned there. So there's the Irish Association's uh, website and then the American Speech and Hearing Association's website as well has some very good information. Um, and the RCSLT is the UK um, professional body. And again, they have very clear information about what speech and language therapists do and who we work with. So I hope you found that um, useful. If you're interested in the idea of speech and language therapy as a career for yourself, um, the university have open days regularly, usually in kind of October or April, um, where we would have talks about the different um, healthcare professions, including speech and language therapy, and you could come and talk to us about um, the profession. It's certainly a very interesting job, like you'll never be bored because everybody who comes through your door is unique and has their own experience and their own story to tell. Um, so it's a very rewarding and very interesting um, profession to be a part of. So thank you for listening and I hope you found this useful.